Jesus. Good afternoon. How are you guys doing? Are we awake? Yes. All right. It's good to see all of you guys. Uh, we miss you guys from the pastoral staff. We want to tell you guys that we love you guys and we miss you guys. And uh, this past week, uh, me, Steve, and James decided that we're going to go live in Southern Cal, right? It is beautiful. No humidity and uh, mid 70s to 80s. It's just, it is beautiful out there. Just kidding. We're not going to leave you guys. We love you guys. We're going to be here with you guys. You guys are going to have to suffer with us. We're all doing, doing this together. That's right. So um, welcome to uh, service this afternoon. We want to welcome Tony Moore from Morganton. Thank you for coming to worship with us. And may the Lord bless you this afternoon. Um, if you're here as a guest for the first time, we just want you to sit back and relax. Um, you know, if you don't feel like participating in the worship, it's okay. Don't worry about having to, to tithe or give or any of that. But we just want your, your presence here to come and worship with us. We're glad that you're here, okay? Uh, just a con- uh, confession that I have to make uh, standing up here. I'm going to make it for you guys because this past week we were in Southern Cal, and I got a chance to hang out with my brothers, Steve, Sivnyova, uh, James, and um, Chris Kerr. So one night, we were going to sleep, and we all were sleeping in the same uh, hotel room. And um, we had one sink. The, bed, the beds were in the, same, in the same room as well. And so I was brushing my teeth, right? James was on one bed. Sivnyova was on the other bed. I think Steve was in the bathroom. Brushing my teeth. And then 30 seconds into it, I was like, dude, this doesn't feel like my toothbrush. Like, it's much softer, feels nicer. I, I took it out and looked at it. It is blue like mine, but it's not mine, right? So it's like, oh, they're not, they're not watching. So I rinsed it. I wiped it down with a towel, put it, put it away. And then I took my toothbrush and brushed it. I think it was, yeah, Steve and James, uh, one of you, <laughs> either one of you, right? But the night after, they got me back. They're like, we're going to go watch a horror movie and you have to go with us. So we're going to go watch Annabella. And, uh, and, you know, James was sitting next to me, and he was, he was like, man, you know, did you see what happened? And I was like, uh-huh, my eyes were closed, but so, uh-huh, I saw it. And later on, we were walking back to the hotel room, and he was talking about all the scary parts. And I was like, yeah, I saw that, but I, I didn't really see that, right? Because <laughs> if I saw it, I would have had to cuddle with uh, Steve and James in the bed. I don't know, they didn't want that, so... Just a lot of fun. Uh, thank you guys for sending us out to Southern Cal to be with Saddleback Church, Purpose Driven Conference Church. And it was amazing. Just affirmation for everything that we are doing here. It, uh, Purpose Driven Church and the principles that we're practicing here is, it's, you know, th- that's why the church is growing. We're loving one another, reaching out to the community, doing missions. So things are going really well. Just a lot of affirmation. So may the Lord bless you guys. Let's go ahead and let's pray together as a congregation. Let's stand up. Why don't we stand up? Let's pray together. Father, we are here. We're ready to worship you. We're ready to give back to you to celebrate all the good things that you have done for us this past week. We thank you for being such a good, good father. And as we stand here, we're going to lift up our hands, lift up our voices. We're going to worship you with all that you've given us, every breath, the breath that you've given us, Lord. And we want to thank you so much. We want to tell you that we love you this afternoon. Speak to us through your word. Speak to us through your music. Uh, Prepare our hearts right now to hear your word. And so we give thanks and we pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so let's worship the Lord together. Let's declare this out. 
This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan? Our son and daughter, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nation with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Sing this out. This is amazing grace. This is a feeling love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would be my cross. You lay down your life. I would be set free. Oh, oh Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. you've done for me Constant grace remains the cornerstone. Things that we thought were dead are breathing in life again because your sun to shine on darkest night. And for all that you've done, we will pour out our love. This will be 
our anthem song. Let's sing this out, church. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one our hearts adore. Hopeless have found their hope. Orphans now have a that was lost has found its place in you. Let's say you lift our weary heads. You lift our weary heads. You make us strong instead. You took these rags and made us beautiful. For all that you've done, we will pour out our love. This will be our anthem song. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one our hearts adore. Let's sing this with one voice. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one our hearts adore. Our hearts adore. Our affection, our devotion Poured out on the feet of Jesus Our affection, our devotion Poured out on the feet of Jesus our affection, our devotion, poured out on the feet of Jesus. Our affection, our devotion, poured out on the feet of Jesus. And our affection, our devotion, poured out on the feet of Jesus. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one our hearts adore. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we We love you. Let's sing with all of our hearts. Oh, how we love you. You are the one our hearts Let's 
sing this song. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one our hearts adore. Amen. I think as Christians, sorry, we sometimes we come to church and we we come and we worship, right? We shout, we sing, we we sing praises, right? But at the same time, I feel like a lot of the times we we say things, we do we say things and we act a certain way, right? And in a sense, like our actions, sometimes it shows that we're Christians. It shows that we believe, right? But um, but many times we hold things back from God. We, um, in a sense, we give Him half-hearted worship, right? In a sense that, you know, when Jesus when Jesus came, right? He said He said that um, He said His Father He doesn't desire for us to, or He desires us to worship in spirit and in truth, right? And a lot of times when we sing and, and we don't give our all when we sing and we don't um, when we sing. And, and it's like our hearts aren't into it, but we're just singing these words. It's it's just worshiping in truth, right? We're just declaring God's message and God's attributes. But but I want to us I want to invite us at this time. I want us to um, I want us to worship authentically. I want us to worship in spirit and in truth, right? That when we when we worship, our hearts are into it. When we worship, we um, we're giving our all, right? And this song this song here it's. It's the chorus goes. If more of you means less of me, take everything, right? And and when we when we sing this in spirit and in truth, this isn't just us saying, you know, take everything. But this is us submitting, us yielding to God, us saying, God, God, have it all, have your way. And so, at this time, let's just let's just take a moment and let's just and let's just meditate. So 
God, I pray, Lord, that, God, you may have your way in this place, God, that, God, we, we yield and we submit, Lord. We give our all to you, God. Have your way in this place, Father. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You guys may be seated.
Hey, welcome again. Uh, it's good to see everyone here. Uh, this is my encouragement for you guys this morning. Uh, the back half of the chapel, the AC is dead. So please come on up, squeeze up front close, all right? I'm not just trying to, guys, trying to get you guys closer, right? Uh, but if you want to feel uh, the Holy Spit from the uh, pulpit, uh, come on closer. It's just a joke. But uh, <clears throat> that, that last song that we just sung there, it, it was beautiful. I don't know about you guys, but those are some challenging words. And I, I wrote them down. Um, and I just want to read this for, with you guys real quick. If more of you means less of me, it says take everything. Right? And uh, the pre-chorus says, Father, I pray make me more like Jesus. Change me like only you can. These are things that you're, you're surrendering. These are things that you're giving up uh, to Jesus. And so I pray that you, that was just in truth because those are just truths. But I pray that as, uh, and I agree with our worship uh, leader there, Kong, that uh, this will be spirit and truth, and it'll ring true in your life today more so than ever, okay? Uh, and so I want to encourage you guys um, that that, you're not just saying that, but you'll really live that out this week and all the days to come. And so uh, today we have a special privilege. If you guys didn't know, we have an intern pastor. Uh, him and his wife have been uh, here over a month and a half now. And today he'll be giving us the word of God. Um, he comes from uh, Sheboygan, Wisconsin, but uh, uh, born uh, and raised there. But uh, he's traveled. He's uh, been in the Navy and uh, to Bible College. And uh, he also went to the same uh, seminary that I went to up uh, at, uh, in New York at Alliance Theological Seminary. And so today, uh, Pastor Ning Yang will be giving us the message so let's just welcome him up right is this on awesome awesome okay well uh yeah just want to say yeah, it's, a, it's such a great privilege to be here with all you guys, um, especially just to give today's word to you guys. Um, a little bit more about me is that, like how uh, Steve, Pastor Steve has said, like, I've, 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 I've grown up in Wisconsin, I've traveled all over the world, and I've been through ins and out of, of, of my life. And if, if you, you guys probably haven't guessed, but I'm, I'm like 30 years old already. I know I, sometimes I may seem young, like some folks like you guys, like 18. Sometimes if, if uh, me and my brother, who's, who just graduated high school, and he went off to the Marines just last week, if we were just to stand together, uh, people would pretty much say that we're twins, or almost like we're, we're brothers and sisters. I mean, brothers, right? <laughs> Not brothers and sisters, brothers. Yes. But, uh, yeah, you know, like, so just growing up, I often see... I was in. I grew up in a church, and I always been wondering, like, if this, if we believe in a God, you know, if we believe in a God who is so powerful and just exactly like the way how we describe Him, then how come we're not seeing His His life transforming us? You know, how come we're not seeing His kingdom in the world? And so for today, I want to take us in this uh, for our message today. Just along the, um, our journey, just to just to learn about His kingdom in the. And so, if you have your Bible with me, um, you can turn to Mark chapter five, verse twenty-one to 40, forty-three, or you guys could follow along. And why don't we stand up together and let's uh, read the scripture together? When Jesus had again crossed over by boat. To the other side of the lake, everybody together, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue's leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped 
and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out of him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace, and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher any more? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him to, except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her hand by the hand and said to her, Halitaka kum, which means, Little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. You may all sit down. Man, it's hot in here, huh? Shoot. So, in order to like understand what's happening about this passage, we have to understand pretty much like the whole context, or like what comes before uh, what this scene that um, we just read about, and. As we can see in the previous chapter, Jesus was preaching about the kingdom of God. And then he was preaching to the crowd in parables. But then later when, when he was with his disciples, he would go and explain in details what the parables meant. And from there on, when, after teaching, the, uh, teaching about the kingdom of God, he crosses over the lake and went over to the side of the Gentiles. And there, it was there where he, he freed a, a man that was demonized. And as you guys probably um, know about this man who was demonized, this, uh, the, the demons that were inside of him was named Legion. And Legion, quite, uh, quite interesting, meant in the, in the Roman term, meant to be 6,000. So maybe it could have been about like 6,000 demons in him. So what Jesus did was that he cast, he cast out the demons and sent them to the pigs, as, as, in, um, as being told in the Bible. And then after that, Jesus crosses back over, to, crosses back over the lake and then go back to the, um, to the other side. And there he's met with a crowd. And that's where we, where we are at today. And the first point that I want to come across... Um, I want to bring to you guys is that the kingdom of God comes through Jesus. The, man, the manifestation of the kingdom of God happens through Jesus. It does not happen apart from Jesus. So when, when we think about it, right, the kingdom of God, it, it cannot happen unless, unless God brings, it, brings it himself here into the world. And that's what Jesus did. Often, it's often referred in a theological world that when Jesus came and died on the cross, and what he did, his ministry here, is often thought of as D-Day. And D-Day is, is the day when, you know, um, the Allied forces in the World War II in 1944, they landed, they sent 100,000 troops into, uh, into the beaches of Normandy. And during that time, once when the, once when, um, the troops landed on, on the beaches of Normandy, Pretty much the whole world knew already that victory was on the, on the side of the Allied side. And, and pretty much, you know, Germany and all, his, and all their allies are going to lose. 
So that's kind of what um, Jesus, so that's kind of the picture of of, um, the kingdom of God. You know, the victory is here. You know, the kingdom of God is here. But then yet, it's still far off because the war has not ended. And so that's what Jesus did. He brought the kingdom of God here. And to that point, you know, like the, with the kingdom of God, it can be accessed by anybody. You know, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. Like in the, in the story, the, in the, in, I say story, but it's also history too. In the history that we read, you know, it was Jarius. He came and to Jesus. And then it was also a, another woman, a, a woman who had spent all she, she had. She was poor, and Jarius was one of the synagogue leaders. And if we want to think about it, it's as, um, Jarius is like, he's, he wasn't a rabbi, so he wasn't like a teacher, but the synagogue itself was like a community center. And so if we, if we kind of just think about it here to church, the, uh, someone who would be considered a synagogue leader is like, uh, the councilman, you know, the chairman. So we can think that like, oh, you know, this is a guy of prominence. This is a guy who is rich, not only materially, but almost uh, as well as his reputation. And so with that, you know, the kingdom of God is here. And the, and the driving point I want to uh, tell you guys is that with, with the kingdom of God being here, it's, it's only manifested if you want it. You know, you, you have to come to Jesus, and it's only through Jesus in order for it to come alive. And, you know, um, in church, a lot of times we often, it's often easy to sit back in the pews, and then we, se- we go on our separate ways, we live our life, and then we don't, see, we don't see the work of God anywhere in our life. You know, sometimes we just, we, just, we just think like, man, sometimes like the preacher or the people up here in the pulpit or whatever, like the Bible, it's, it's not real enough in my life. It, it's, it's not here, but it's not tangible. But then the, the, the truth to it is that we're not, actually, we're not actually drawing into Jesus. You know, we're not being plugged into Jesus. Just like notice how like Jairus and the woman's... Um, the woman with the with the discharge of blood, uh, notice what they did. They came to Jesus. You know, the, they came to Jesus because he was the the source of the power. He was the source of the manifestation of the kingdom of God. And so, with that said, I just um, the kingdom of God won't, won't come by the whim of a passivity, not not wishful thinking. Um. A lot of times, yes, what we, the, the mindset that we kind of have to understand with the kingdom of God is that we have to expect God to show up, but then we have to also have to have no agenda with God. You know, we, the, this is, this, the, uh, the phrase expectation with, without agenda comes from uh, my, my professor up at, up at New York. He says that, you know, when we when we 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 have to expect Jesus to show up to bring the kingdom here it, into our lives, so therefore the the power of the kingdom can manifest. But that's the only pretty much that's the only expectation that we should be expecting from Jesus. But we shouldn't give like an agenda to when or how it should come. Like sometimes we're really eager and we want it like now. Like for me, a lot of instances, I really want to be, let's say, if I really want to be healed, right? Like um, I, just get, I just recently, this week, I just got a bunch of, uh, maybe it's not sores, but I feel like it's allergies. And so like I just want God to heal this now. But, but, but you, you know, with, with that, you know, I... I I have to position myself. I have to rethink my mind. I have to think that yes, God can, Jesus can make it happen. But I, sh- I shouldn't have any ex- any uh, agenda for it. But I should expect Jesus to bring the healing and bring His uh, His kingdom here. And moving on, 
when the kingdom of God manifests, it brings redemption and restoration. My professor up at uh, New York, he says this about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the reversal of everything that went wrong when sin entered the world. It's the restoration of the way God intended things to be. Uh, my professor is Dr. Reamer. Uh, many, many of you guys here might have read his book uh, called Soul Care. And he's saying like, and he, he tells this about the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God is, a, is the life that we're supposed to be living here. It's, it is supposed to be here in on earth, right? But then it's, it's because we live in this, like, in this era where, where it's here, but yet it's not here yet. So sometimes when, when we think about the kingdom of, about being here in, in the world, it's not here yet because there's still, there's still sin in the world. Sometimes it's still a battle. It's still a battle that we still have to go through. Um, and with the kingdom of God, if it's not only... It's not, it's not only access through physical um, healing, but it also brings inner healing and all, and all the uh, restoration. And I, I just want to show it to you, I just want to um, uh, show to you what uh, Jesus does to the, to the woman with the blood discharge and to Jairus. In, uh, in verse 33, it says, Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. And trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. So about this woman, right, who, had, who was having this discharge of blood for 12 years. In, in the Jewish law, according to Leviticus chapter 15, you know, she would be considered unclean. And being unclean, that means that she would have to be uh, outside of, of her community you know, she's, she's pretty much thought of like um, an alien from, from the society. And so what, what should have happened was that when she came to Jesus, she should have announced to the whole crowd, and in, including to Jesus, Hey, I'm, a, I'm, I'm unclean, you know, I'm unclean, and I'm going to be coming to you, Jesus. He, you know, Jesus, I'm, I'm dirty, you know. But then instead of, what she, instead of what she did was that, instead of what she did, and she did it sneakily, as we can see, as we read in here too, she just came pressing through the crowds and not knowing, not telling anybody, and she touched, she didn't even touch Jesus, but she just touched his cloak. And you can imagine, and, and once Jesus, uh, once he knew that the power went out of him, he knew, he knew that someone here was, was healed. He knew that the kingdom of God just manifested right there. But then, um, so he looked around, and, and the woman, and the, and the woman, you know, knowing that she, can't, she couldn't hide anymore, she came clean, and she told him the whole truth. And with that, you know, instead of condemning, instead of condemning her, Jesus actually commends her, which is kind of, it kind of goes against our logic, because here was, here's a woman who is ceremonially, ritually unclean. You know, she should have announced to the whole crowd, she should have announced to even Jesus that she was unclean and she wants to see Jesus. But, you know, by her pressing through the crowds and coming and even touching the cloak of Jesus, it makes Jesus unclean. It makes the people in the crowd unclean. And therefore, you know, like with all of them being unclean, it, it, it meant that they have to be cleansed. It meant that they would have their day right there is kind of like, it's kind of gone already. So they would... Instead of, instead of, for Jesus, instead of him going to see Jairus' daughter, he would have, ritually, he would have went back. He would have to, like, go back and isolate himself from society, from community, and just uh, wait until the evening, then wash himself and be ritually unclean, to be ritually clean. And just, and that goes the same with all the folks that she touched but, you know, here in the story, Jesus, we find that Jesus actually commends the woman. 
And along with that too, it's not just she, Jesus just didn't commend and praise her, but Jesus also t- uh, renounced her back into community. She also he also uh, um, elevated her status because the first word that Jesus said to her is daughter. You know, instead of saying like you, you, you know, like you sinner, you know, he he. He restores her dignity. He restores her back into the place of belonging, into the place of community, and he calls her daughter. And that's what the kingdom is right there. It's the restoration. It's the restoration and the redemption of all that has gone wrong in the world. And in the end, you know, like the woman, she didn't only leave with just the physical being healed, but she also um, she also was restored and and she was also redeemed back into her community. And as we look at Jairus in verse 35, it says, While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing the, what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid, just believe. You know, at this point, at this point, when um, people from his house just came in and told, just told uh, Jairus that his daughter was dead, you know, you just kind of have to stop and pause for a moment right there. You know, here he was. You know, he went, he went to the beach. He went to wait for Jesus. And once he's, he is Jesus, he's so eager. He wants Jesus to quickly come and bring, uh, bring his. Bring the kingdom, bring his healing touch into, into his daughter. But then, but then while, while in the midst of traveling, they got stopped by a woman, you know. And then but while being stopped right there, her daughter dies. And, and he receives the news, you know. And, and, then, and then Jesus, and he was, told, he was told that her daughters did. But then Jesus, you know, overhearing that, Jesus turns to him and just... And just, you know, just emotionally comforted him. It's just telling him just to not be afraid, but just to continue to believe. With that said, you know, Jairus at that point, he had to make a decision. He had to either stay with his logic, which says that the dead stays dead, you know. You know, it's a, it's a guaranteed ratio of one of one. You know, everybody stays dead. Or he, he could believe furthermore. He could believe on into Jesus. And so... And so, with just this right here, you know, um, I just, I just want to point out that Jesus not only comforted, not only was bringing the emotional comfort to Jairus, but he was also declaring, he's also making a statement that the kingdom of God is possible through him if he believed. And to that comes the last point I want to point out. That, per, that the pursuing the kingdom of God means to go deeper with Jesus. So in verse 37, we, we see that Jesus only took uh, Peter, James, and John, and he, and, and he excluded everybody else, all his other disciples, and all the crowds and everyone who else who was following, and he took only those three and Jairus in, back into, into the place where um, the little girl was. And in there, you know, uh, when he went there, people mocked him when he said, like, when he, he said that the, uh, Jairus' daughter was only sleeping. And so what Jesus was trying to do there was that Jesus was trying to only, he was only bringing people who were going to believe in him. So he, and in that space where, where, uh, where the little girl was, there was, there's a space of belief, you know, it's, the kingdom of God cannot be accessed. It can't be accessed by people who have unbelief. Even if, even if you don't have belief, but even if, you don't ha- if you're not willing to step up to the plate, as I would say, if you're not willing to take the initiative to, to firmly and to go boldly and believe in Jesus, the kingdom of God won't come. You know? And with that, you know, the... the I'm saying here, the, exper- the experiential revelation of the kingdom comes only to those who are willing to pray, who are willing to pay for the price of coming after him. 
um, one of my professors up at ATS, up at New York, he 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 talks, he tells the story about um, a, he tells the story about his two a two a m friend, and um, in this story, he says that um, one. One night, Jesus woke up, uh, woke him up in the middle of the night around 2 a.m. Right, and Jesus wanted to tell him something, uh, something important. And then Jesus, Jesus t- tells him, um, and that uh, his class was full of demons. You know, his class was full of demons because like the people were being demonized. And then he, he, you know, he he was joking with Jesus. My professor, you know, he said this, like, you know, like, Jesus, you could have told me that in, at 6 o'clock, you know. But then, but then uh, Jesus, Jesus, you know, like, being, being on, the, being friend to him, Jesus told him, uh, the, my professor, like, you know, there's only some things that I would tell my 2 o'clock friend instead of my 6 o'clock friends. And with that said, um, with with that point, with that story, I just want to drive to this point that like the the kingdom coming after Jesus, you have to you have to pay the price for it. The point the point of the point of the kingdom can only come when you go after Jesus. And pretty much every if wherever you guys are here in in your uh, current state of life right here. And how much you're seeing the kingdom is the pr- amount of price that you're willing to pay for it. And so to conclude, I just want to, I just want us to reflect on this. Um, I invite all you guys to stand up, Ashley, and and I just to just kind of uh, close your eyes for a moment. I want you guys to think to yourself. Like where are where do you guys find yourself? You know, are you guys in alignment with Jesus? Are you guys are you guys experiencing the kingdom of God here and now? You know, because the reality is the kingdom is here. The kingdom is here, but it's not fully here yet. But are we willing to take that next step to believe in Jesus, even if we're, we don't see the presence of the of the kingdom of God? And I want want to pray a blessing over you guys right now. Jesus, you're so good. And you you want everyone in this room to experience your kingdom. Because it's all about you. You want each and every single individual in here to experience your kingdom. And I pray that... Jesus, as everyone, each individual, they leave this place. They may experience your kingdom. They may experience the, the, revel- the revelation of who you are, that, that you show yourself to them, and that they explore it more, that they dive deeper, that they, pay, they go the cost, that they're willing to pay the cost just to come and follow you. And, they, and in the in the process, they see your kingdom manifest. The healings come. Deliverance come. And everything, all the social injustice comes because in your kingdom, there is no more sin. In your kingdom, there is restoration. There is redemption. So Jesus, I pray and I bless every single individual in here that as they go throughout this week, they may experience you. That they may, they may see your kingdom come alive. And I pray, Jesus, that you draw them close to you, and they, you open up their hearts so they may dive deeper with you. With that said, in your name I pray. Amen. And that's it. <laughs>